Hello guys, Alexander Robinson here. Just wanted to briefly say that the audio quality on this show is a little hot. Huh? As in, the mic that I was recording on made the audio come off as a little too loud, so it might not sound normal like it is in this little recording that I'm doing right now. Huh? So I just wanted to give an update on that. Don't let it ruin the show for you, uh, because this show's been a long time coming. And um, without further ado, I just wanted to say um, thank you for tuning in. There's no, there's going to be no Slender the Arrival Part 3 today. Instead, you're getting this. Uh, and I'll put up Part 3 of Slender the Arrival next week. I just wanted to do this little intro to let you know that I fixed the issue with my mic. And the shows from now on should sound A-OK. -okay. So, thank you for listening and enjoy. This week on the Alexander Robinson Movie News Show, we have a villain for Ben Affleck's upcoming Batman movie. We have two trailers to talk about, one of which is good, the other not so much. A certain monster slash robot movie that I believe would never happen is finally happening. And the latest Disney animated film gets its live action treatment. It's all coming up right here on the Alexander Robinson Movie News Show. Get ready for the Alexander Robinson Movie News Show, featuring the latest news about the movies you want to see. Starting in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hello everyone, it's Alex the Real Mr. Robinson here and welcome to episode 16 of the Alexander Robinson Movie News Show and it's been a while. Too long, I might say. So, if you're brand new to this channel, and if, if you are, first of all, thank you for subscribing and joining. Um, I would like to say that if you go back to episode 15, I said I was going to try an experiment where I would do... The podcast for a month like it would be a monthly podcast uh, rather than a weekly podcast like it used to be the reason was uh, I got really busy with um, some stuff in my personal life whether it's my paying job and just other stuff that I felt like I had to slow down in terms of the videos I put out uh, I my main focus is still movie reviews uh, and movie related stuff but the podcast was a little too much to do all by myself because I had to record it edit it export it post it all by myself no help at all and I figured it'd be might be easier to just round up everything from the month into one episode it turns out um, that experiment might not be working out too well because it's all we're close to the middle of October and I'm already making this show dedicated to the stories the movie news stories from September so I think from now on I'm gonna do it um, the show every other week so basically two shows a month huh? one at the halfway point and one at the end uh, so we're just going to start right now with um, the news stories of September. So without further ado, let's talk about um, let's talk about a sad story. Yeah? I mean, these stories are ver fairly old. Some of them are quite recent, but um, most of them are pretty old. Uh, let's talk about Gene Wilder. Uh, earlier in September, Gene Wilder who's best known for being Willy Wonka in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, passed away at the age of 83. And, you know, I gotta say, it's sad that he died. But in a year when celebrities are dying left and right, whether they're too young and dying of some sort of disease, I mean, Gene Wilder did have Alzheimer's, and it's pretty sad. But I would say, compared to everybody else, like... Prince, David Bowie, Anton Yelchin. Gene Wilder did live a pretty good life. Uh, he died at 83, which 
it is really a long time to live. Uh, when you hit that age, uh, somewhere around that age, then it, it's kind of like okay to go. I mean, it's sad and we will miss you, uh, but you really lived a great life. And Gene Wilder, he was one of those actors, comedy actors, that really could balance very calm and casual with batshit insanity. Some people have said that he's sort of like Nicolas Cage, but in a good way. And that is kind of true. He can be very unpredictable with the way he acts. For example, in Young Frankenstein, he can really flip his shit without a moment of notice and then suddenly go to a scene where he's very calm and collective. But it was in a really convincing and dedicated way. Gene Wilder is just really entertaining in most of the stuff he's in, particularly, as I mentioned, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, which was his most iconic role. And one of the unique things about that movie is that Gene Wilder said he would not do it unless he was allowed to do the opening introduction scene to Willy Wonka, where he's basically appears to be crippled and he's walking out with a cane and then he kind of lets go of the cane unnoticeably falls but then um does a spin on the ground and stands back up showing to the world that he's not crippled and the reason for that is just to show how unpredictable Willy Wonka could be so that's his most famous role and his portrayal of Willy Wonka is the thing that made that movie what it is today. And it's the default Willy Wonka that people think of. But he's also really well known for Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein, which are two Mel Brooks movies. Both really great. Young Frankenstein is my favorite. I'll elaborate more on why in my upcoming review for Young Frankenstein because I do plan to review that movie on the last week of October, like sort of like what I did with last year where I reviewed Night of the Living Dead, Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, It Follows, The Cabin in the Woods, and The Rocky Horror Picture Show. I do plan to review five horror or horror-esque movies on the last week of October, and Young Frankenstein will be the first review. I figured that doing that review would be a great way to remember Gene Wilder, and plus, it's just a really great movie anyway. The other four reviews, I'm not going to say what they are until the time comes. But Gene Wilder, anyway, rest in peace, a legend in terms of acting and comedy. So let's move on. Let's move on to DC. Um, let's talk about The Batman, which supposedly is going to come out sometime around 2018 and Ben Affleck has revealed that Deathstroke will be the main villain of the film. Now let me tell you how I heard about this news. It was the way I heard of it. I thought that Deathstroke was going to be in Justice League. He was going to be the main villain of the Justice League movie. And my first reaction to that was seriously? I mean, I really don't know much about Deathstroke, to be totally honest. Uh, I just think of him as DC's equivalent of Deadpool. Or I guess Deadpool would be Marvel's equivalent to Deathstroke. But regardless, uh, I thought to myself, really? The main villain to gather all these heroes together is a mercenary? Are you kidding me? And then as more stories popped up, it said, for the Batman movie. I'm like, oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And... I don't know how to feel about this. I do not know much about Deathstroke to really get any sort of beat on how to feel. But I'm glad that we're getting a different kind of villain and not like the Joker or Bane or the Penguin or some villains that we've seen done before already. Deathstroke has never really been in a movie, so it'll be exciting to see. And he's going to be played by Joe Mang Magniello. So... We'll see what happens there, but another reason why I'm skeptical is because DC is really not in a good position right now. They've had three movies. Uh, one of them was just okay, ranging from mediocre to okay. Another one was really shitty, god-awful, but had some really good moments in it. And then the other one was just plain bad. So DC needs to win me over. If Wonder Woman ends up being a critical failure and I don't like it, then I'm done pretty much. Like, I 
cannot stand to watch any more DC movies if Wonder Woman sucks. Huh? And I don't want it to, because huh? I look at that as, if that sucks, that's the third strike. Huh? And I know that technically it is the fourth DC Extended Universe movie, but I kind of lump Man of Steel and Batman vs. Superman together because they're both directed by Zack Snyder. I mean, at this point, Snyder is done for me. Like, he's not to be trusted with free reign at all. But I lumped those together as Strike 1. Strike 2 was with Suicide Squad because it was the first one with a different director, and it sucked balls. So Strike 3 would be Wonder Woman. If it's good, then... I'll give Justice League a shot, even though I'm skeptical because it's Zack Snyder still. But again, if Wonder Woman is good, then I haven't completely lost hope in the DC Extended Universe. So, we'll see where this goes. Uh, uh, moving on, let's talk about two trailers. One of which is a trailer for a movie that I'm really, really not looking forward to at all. And that is Fifty Shades Darker, the sequel to Fifty Shades of Grey. And, okay... Fifty Shades of Grey was, when it came out last year, was one of the worst movies uh, I had seen uh, of the year. Uh, it was probably the second worst I've seen, the first being Fantastic Four. And the reason is because, well, outside of the fact that it comes from Twilight fan fiction that is poorly written and written on a goddamn Blackberry... Uh, it's just really an uncomfortable movie. Like, it's trying to be all romantic, but it's just really creepy. Christian Grey is a creepy character, just always on uh, Anastasia Steele, like a hawk, staring at her, waiting for her to turn around a corner. It's just, he's pretty much like a serial killer. It's really close to the point where if they decide to make him a serial killer by the last movie, I wouldn't be surprised at all. It's like, well, we saw this coming because of the way he acts. And I don't know. The, the best thing I could say about this trailer is that the production design looks a little better than the first one. That's pretty much it. I mean, I, I really don't want to see this movie, but I'm going to see it. Two reasons. A, if it's as bad as I think it could be, uh, then it'll make for a really entertaining review. Uh, but the more important reason is because I actually know somebody who did work on the movie. And I'm one of those guys that, even though if a movie's bad or I don't want to see it, if I know somebody who worked on it, uh, then I'm willing to go see it, like, just out of support for them. Uh, because that's the kind of guy I am. So... I mean, it comes out uh, Valentine's Day. Uh, whether or not it'll break Deadpool's opening record for Valentine's Day, we have yet to find out. But until then, let's talk about a trailer for a possibly better movie, which is Passenger, starring Jennifer Lawrence and Chris Pratt. Uh, this trailer looks rather interesting, I gotta say. I mean, Jennifer Lawrence and Chris Pratt are two actors that have really great charisma, and I feel like these two will have really great chemistry with each other. And it, the way it looks, it's sort of like a science fiction bottle film, uh, which I'm really fascinated when films do these kind of bottle episode type scenarios. And it's really something difficult to pull off because if you don't know what a bottle episode is, basically it's a term used in TV where an episode takes place in one specific location, like just one set. And that's it. Community did an episode. There have been a couple of other TV shows that have done it. But it's mainly used in TV because when you take film into account, it's much harder to do because it's more – It's the film's longer. So you really need to depend on the charisma of your actors. And with two dynamic actors like Jennifer Lawrence and Chris Pratt, that could be an easy thing to accomplish. So, I mean, th I think this looks good. I don't really have much else to say. I'm looking forward to seeing it, and I'm hoping for the best. So, you know what? Let's take a quick break. Um, and when we come back, more movie news on the way. Love what I'm doing on this channel? Love watching movie reviews, let's plays, or podcasts? Want to help the channel grow even further? 
then you can go over to patreon.com slash therealmrrobinson and give out a monthly donation and you'll help the channel grow. In return, you'll get special rewards such as access to retro reviews, let's plays, and podcasts before anyone else does. And if you don't want to donate or can't donate, then hey, that's perfectly awesome. You get awesome content regardless. But the really cool thing is you can donate maybe as little as a penny. You can donate a penny a month if you want. So, I mean, any little bit will do, and your support is greatly appreciated. So again, that's patreon.com slash therealmrrobinson. Go over there and donate. Help this channel grow. Again, patreon.com slash therealmrrobinson. Alright, we're back from a quick break, and one thing I wanted to address that I forgot to do at the beginning of the show is that normally I like to have articles pulled up, and I like to read quotes from the articles on specific news stories. Since I have a lot to go through this time, I'm just kind of breezing through it and just narrowing it down to my own personal opinions. I'd like to be a little more organized with having articles up for these podcasts, but since there's a lot of news stories to talk about, I just feel like for the sake of time, it's best to just narrow it down to my personal opinion. So without further ado, let's move on to a story that makes me eat my own words. So Pacific Rim 2 has been a sequel that has just been through hell and back in terms of its production. So if you remember Pacific Rim from 2013 by Guillermo del Toro, it was a fun movie. I really liked it a lot, uh, mainly because I grew up with the Godzilla movies, so seeing giant monsters and robots fight each other was really cool, and I think Guillermo del Toro really does have a great love for um, the genre, because I remember I was at a Q&A screening with Guillermo del Toro of Pacific Rim, and he mentions that one of his favorite monsters is Baragon from Frankenstein Conquers the World, or Frankenstein vs. Baragon, which I thought, wow, this guy really knows his uh, Toho monsters. That's awesome. But as much as I enjoyed the movie, it didn't do financially well in the United States. It did really well in China, which warranted a sequel to get made. But throughout the whole development, uh, Pacific Rim 2 is very much like Avatar 2, where I'm convinced that it's not going to happen. Like people say it's keep con- it like people say it's going to happen uh, over and over again. I'm like, "Nope, I don't believe it." Well, turns out they have a shooting date. Uh, Pacific Rim 2 is going to start filming in November, which makes me go, okay then, I guess it is happening. And um, I, I actually don't know how to feel about this. I mean, on one hand, I'm really curious to see more about this universe. But on the other hand, Pacific Rim ended in a way where it didn't really need a sequel. It ended on a way where it tied up the loose ends. Uh, Nothing I felt like was left open for questioning. uh, And it just kind of had a wrap, and it just kind of had a nice wrap up. uh, Not really much else to do in terms of exploring that world. But I am very curious for the sequel. And plus, I mean, more robots and monsters beating the shit out of each other is always entertaining, whether it's suit actors or CG. Uh, There's there's nothing wrong about watching those fight scenes. What I would really like instead of the sequel to Pacific Rim, I'd like a Pacific Rim animated series that takes place uh, between the first kaiju attack and the events that... and the events of the movie. Yeah? So that would be really cool to see. We explore different Jaeger pilots, uh, create a whole bunch of unique kaiju. It'd be... I think that would be a really cool idea, but I'm down for a sequel. I'm curious about it, so we'll see what happens. Uh, Next up, we have some new Star Wars news. Or This is actually a news story that I've already talked about in a separate review. If you go to my channel, I did a Screen Junkies audition tape for Screen Junkies News, the new channel that they're launching soon. As of this recording, I have yet to hear anything back, but um, I'll, I'll wait to see what happens. But anyway, the thing that they asked for in that audition tape was to 
really talk about a news story and just how would you approach talking about it. And so the news story I decided to talk about was the fact that a third Star Wars anthology film has been confirmed for 2020. There's no real idea of what the movie's going to be about, but Bob Iger, the head of Disney, did say that a writer's been attached to it, so we'll see what happens. I briefly said that I think these anthology films are good for expanding the universe uh, and telling stories beyond the saga films, which are focused on the Skywalker family. And one of the examples I listed was that it could focus on the bounty hunters of the Galactic Civil War, like Boba Fett, Dangar, and Bosk. And some people have said, well, we don't really want a Boba Fett movie because... Like, it'd have to, you'd have to make Boba Fett a character and take the mystery out of him. And to that, I say, you're absolutely right. Uh, Boba Fett is best when he's mysterious. That's why I feel like it would be better to make it an ensemble movie rather than just a solo movie. Like, make it where the Galactic Empire or some other faction is trying to track down a target that's incredibly dangerous, but one bounty hunter can't do it alone, so they're willing to pay a group of bounty hunters a very large sum each to capture this target. That way Boba Fett can still be somewhat mysterious, and he could never take the helmet off. But I think what would be really cool is to see uh, an anthology film that takes place before the prequels. Like, give us a movie about the Old Republic. Give us a movie about an era of Star Wars that's been untouched in films. Because right now, we have Rogue One and we have um, the Han Solo movie coming out by Phil Lord and Chris Pratt. Phil Lord and Chris Pratt. Phil Lord and Chris Miller. I think it would be interesting to move away from that era between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope to, to focus on an area of Star Wars that's not really known to filmgoers. Uh, that would be an interesting idea to see right there. But, um, I mean, I'm curious to see what this anthology film will be. We still have a ways to go since it is going to come out in 2020. And uh, if you want to see my audition tape for Screen Junkies News, you can go to my channel and just check it out. It's Screen Junkies News Audition Tape. Uh, so, uh, moving on, let's talk about Disney. We're getting to the end of the show here. Um, so, Disney is on a roll with making live-action versions of their animated films. Huh? I mean, Jungle Book was actually really good, I gotta say. Uh, much better than it probably should have been, considering the original film, the original animated film, was not one of their best, to be honest. But now... They're going to tackle The Lion King, and it's going to be directed by Jon Favreau, who did The Jungle Book, huh? which sounds somewhat exciting, and I'm very curious, I have to admit, but I'm also a little concerned. And here's why. Jon Favreau is a good director. Nothing I'm going to say is going to take that away from him. The problem, however, is that The Lion King, unlike The Jungle Book, huh? is a classic Disney film. So with this upcoming version of The Lion King, there's going to be a lot to live up to, unlike The Jungle Book or Pete's Dragon, which didn't really have that much to compete against. And given that The Jungle Book that Jon Favreau did has qualities of The Lion King in it, it's going to be really hard for Jon Favreau to try to do something with The Lion King without making us go, Oh, I remember that from Jungle Book. Uh, so it's going to be a tricky thing to do. Uh, but um, I think he could probably pull it off. John Favreau, again, is a really good director. So um, I I'm curious about this. I'm hopeful and I'm curious. Uh, what I'm cautious about, what I'm curious but very cautious about, is Disney's live-action version of Beauty and the Beast, which moves into our next bit of news story, was that... Images have popped up showing um, Dan Stevens as the Beast and Emma Watson as Belle. And they're pretty good, I gotta say. I mean, I think Emma Watson is, like, the perfect choice for Belle, I have to say. Uh, but here's what I'm gonna say here. Lion King is a really great Disney film. Uh, 
it's one of my favorites. It's not in my top 10 of animated films, period. But it is in my top 10 of Disney films. Beauty and the Beast is my second favorite Disney animated film ever. This upcoming adaptation of Beauty and the Beast has a lot to live up to. And I'm probably going to be more harsh on the movie than most people. Just because I love that original animated film so much. I think it's a beautiful masterpiece. So I'm very cautious about this one. And after um, Alice in Wonderland, which I know that was six years ago. But Alice in Wonderland is my favorite Disney film from that era when Walt Disney was alive. And the Tim Burton movie was garbage. I'm going into Beauty and the Beast with... Um, a pitchfork, just kind of keeping it at di at a distance because I don't want to get my hopes up too high and then when the movie's bad, I'm going to be sorely disappointed. I don't want to do that. Huh? And what worked about Jungle Book is that, again, the original animated film was not that great to begin with. I mean, I rewatched it a couple of uh, weeks ago and it is good. It's better... Than I remember, but it's not a classic by any means. Uh, so, Beauty and the Beast, I'm cautiously optimistic about it because I don't want, I don't want to get hurt. Uh, and um, I know there was a recent story that broke about another Disney classic that's getting the live action treatment, but we'll talk about that on the next podcast because this is a show dedicated to the stories of September. Now, uh, the last story I want to talk about is more of a reminder. So, this podcast is for October 11th, 2016. Godzilla Resurgence, or Shin Gojira, starts its limited theatrical run tonight uh, and ends on October 18th. So, that's just a little reminder. Um, I have an early review of the film on my YouTube channel, so you can go check that out. But if you live in the United States or Canada, its limited theatrical run starts tonight. And you have about a week to go see it. And this is not a situation where Funimation is paying me to say this. I'm saying this because it is technically a news story that came out earlier in the month. And I just love Godzilla, and I feel like... With Godzilla Resurgence, you should probably go see the movie in the theater. I mean, if you're a hardcore Godzilla fan, chances are you're going to see it anyway. You've already purchased your tickets in advance, I'm guessing. But for the general audience there, I would recommend to at least give this a shot because it would be an interesting movie to see. And um, that pretty much does it for the news. I will have a spoiler review for Godzilla Resurgence or... Shin Godzilla uh, around Thursday uh, so um, keep, keep your eyes open for that but and um, that does it for the news but before we end we gotta talk about blu-rays uh, there are a lot of noteworthy blu-rays to talk about um, in the month of September but I'm not really going to talk about them in detail I'm just gonna name drop these releases because uh, some of them I've already talked about in a separate review I made uh, uh, concerning my um, Blu-ray pickups. So without going into detail, here's what came out last month on Blu-ray. We have the Star Trek 50th Anniversary TV and Movie Collection on Blu-ray, which features the original series on TV, the animated series, and the first six films. Uh, All the Way, featuring Brian Cranston as LBJ and Anthony Mackie as Martin Luther King. Uh, the Flash Season 2, The Iron Giant on Blu-ray, finally. Uh, American Crime Story, The People vs. O.J. Simpson, which is a fantastic miniseries. Uh, now You See Me Too, A Boy Named Charlie Brown, uh, Snoopy Come Home, uh, South Park Season 19, uh, Captain America Civil War, uh, The Return of Godzilla, The Conjuring 2, The Frankenstein Complete Legacy Collection, the Wolfman Complete Legacy Collection. Pop Star Never Stop Never Never Stop Never Stopping. Oh, that's a mouthful. Transformers the Movie from 1986. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows. Bill and Ted's Most Excellent Collection featuring a limited edition Rufus action figure. The 25th Anniversary 
edition of Beauty and the Beast as part of the Walt Disney Signature Collection. Uh, Neighbors 2, The Shallows starring Blake Lively, Warcraft, Central Intelligence, and lastly, Mike and Dave Need Wedding Dates. Uh, and that pretty much does it for the show. Thank you guys for tuning in. I do apologize for this coming out as late as it is. Uh, so I'm going to try to stick with the uh, plan of having the show come out every two weeks. So that means the next show I want to put out on Sunday. Let's let's make it that. You'll get the next show. You'll get much quicker than anticipated. Uh, so until then, I hope you enjoyed it. Leave a comment down below and tell me what your thoughts are on each of these news stories or which news story did you like the most. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, share me with your friends. Don't forget to check out my official website. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Periscope, Rift.tv. And if you love what I'm doing on this channel, whether it's movie reviews, Let's Plays, or podcasts, you can go over to Patreon.com slash TheRealMrRobinson and give out a small monthly donation. So until next time, this is The Real Mr. Robinson telling you there's only one.